Sensitive LA website and a recording would, would, would also be published um, to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken on this meeting, so that means your presence and any contribution made to the meeting will be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly to the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continu continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. We have on leave Councillor Martin and we have apologies from the Lord Mayor Councillor Donovan and Councillor Moran, and I believe maybe possibly Councillor Mackey, but uh, we'll wait and see. I now seek a mover and a seconder for the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on the 1st of June and to be taken as read and be confirmed as an accurate recording of the proceedings of Councillor Knoll, seconder Councillor Ho. Would you like to speak to that? Anyone else like to speak to that? We'll take it to a vote. Those in favour? Those against? Motion is carried. I just want to make a mention uh, that we do have quorum, even though we um, <laughs> only just. So if you need to go to the toilet or anything like that, just let me know. We have to break. Um, <laughs> um, but um, um, we'll continue on. Um, members, I'd like to bring forward the item 4.2. Um, as we have um, people, external consultants here in regards to 4.2, which is the representation review round one consultation. I'm taking the uh, papers as read. If there's anything that you would like to clarify the papers or you might have any questions or any items of discussion, please let me know. Councillors? Anyone? Oh, yeah? Thank you, Chair. Uh, we've got Sarah Gilmer from Holmes Dye with us today, and she's going to run through the results of the community consultation from round one. Um, we'll try and skip through it and just um, look at the results and not the rest of the presentation. Um, and happy with any questions. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, have we got the presentation up on the slides or? Yep. Yeah, I think yeah. so. If you want to see, yeah. you've got the. You can just oh, I have got the. Okay. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so we might just skip forward. Um, so, really, I think most members now are familiar with the representation review process that we're going through. The review was initiated and we started the process with the options paper. So the options paper has been out for consultation and we're really tonight just wanting to give you a summary or some feedback on what the community has said about the options and then start to get you thinking about what might be in the review report. Um, the review report will then go out for consultation. Again, there will be public hearing this time and then you'll get to your final point. So we're about midway in this process now. Um, I don't know that I need to do this in much detail, but the consultation period has met its statutory period, so it did need to be out for a certain amount of time and you used a number of mechanisms to get it to your community. So unless there are questions about that, it was a consultation run by council um, and there were online and hard copy forms available. So in terms of the response, it was a very good response from our perspective. So you did get up close to 100, which for this sort of process is, is actually pretty good. Um, the four submissions that were received from community organisations, I'll just note that a number of those submissions did say that they'd like to be counted as more than one, but obviously as a community submission or a community organisation, we've um, just included those in the package. Um, the, the chart here is really just to show you, and at the bottom there it's raw numbers, but it's just to give you a sense that um, when people provided their submission, they could talk to which areas they were interested in. And this is really just to give you some confidence that we've looked at or people from each of the wards or interested in each of the wards have actually responded. Um, a number of people were interested in the council area as a whole. Down toward the bottom of that chart, there were people just interested in their ward, but there was also combinations. So we feel like we've got a really good sample from the community. 
So in summary, um, there is really strong support in, in the public consultation um, to the Lord Mayor being elected by the whole. So the community still want to have a say in who gets voted into that position. On balance, we put six options to the community, if you remember. Um, the option that has come back with the most agreement is option two, which is really the three wards that you've got as close as practical to what the boundaries are now. Um, but we will need to look at the number of councillors representing. Um, we also ask people about the naming of wards and there is support for retaining pretty well what you've got. There is support for geographical names. So this is just a quick chart to show you. It was quite, I think it's about just over 80%. Um, so that's a fairly clear indication for council in terms of the election of the Lord Mayor. Um, and then I'll go through each of the options just quickly and we'll look at the summary chart because really the summary chart gives you that comparison. But for this one here, you can see that there was um, people that were likely to agree with just having area were likely to strongly agree, but there was also quite a bit of disagreement um, in the community. So we wouldn't say on the whole, this, this was well supported across the whole community. Each of the other options all had some sort of ward structure. So this is the one that got the most agreement. This is option two. You can see people typically agreed um, or strongly agreed. There was a little bit of in the middle and then lower levels we were seeing of disagreement or strong disagreement. And again, we've just pr provided you with these charts for each of the options and you'll see there was variations, but um, some of the options generated more in the middle response and there were some very clear no's as well. So you can start to see through the charts some of the options that people didn't think were, were important. So if we skip to the, the summary, I guess what this is showing you is that on the whole, on balance, we're talking about option two as we move forward. So as we go into the representation review report, um, we would be going back to the community and talking to them about how option two can work. Um, obviously, that will be subject to council's decision and, and what council wants to put back to the community, but the consultation process has probably given us a fairly clear indication of where your community is currently sitting. We also asked as part of the consultation about the total number of representatives and what people thought would be a good number. You'll see there there's a level of comfort with the 12 members that you've currently got. Um, but if you combine those other numbers, you'll see that there's about 60 respondents out of the 89 that said actually we could do with a few less. As you move away from 12, you see that those numbers are slightly bigger. So around eight and nine, it's comparable to the 12. So on the whole, we would say there is support in your community for looking at less elected members as you move forward. Um, and I will just note, we haven't put it on the chart, but there was a small sample that said seven or, or fewer. So, you know, there was an indication from this consultation that numbers is something that the council could certainly turn its mind to. So I'll just pause there and see if there's any questions on, on the consultation and then I'll talk about how that could look. Councillor Hyde. Yeah, just um, thank you for that. I'm just wondering, was there any sort of, I know you've spoken about wards and where people are from, um, representation is more just more than about you know, just geography. Um, did you have any breakdown of age groups and you know, probably age groups in particular I'd, I'd be interested in um, as, as a young person, obviously young people I think don't engage with local government um, uh, as much. I'm not saying I necessarily give them any greater weighting or otherwise I'm just be really interested to know what they're thinking and if they Submitted to the consultation board. Do we have those figures? Through the presiding member, yes, you did collect that information. I haven't done numbers on that for you tonight. I presume it's something that we could get to if, if you wanted to have a look at the, the full demographic breakdown. Um, but yes, we feel like the consultation is fairly representative. So um, yeah, I, I don't yeah, have the exact no. number of that's, that's what you're looking for. And um, how, I know we only do this what, every seven years or more so. How does this number of respondents, obviously 100 out of 20,000 residents we have at the moment, how does that compare to the previous one and submissions received then? And what was that, 2013? I don't have the number, but from previous experience and speaking to other people, that's a really high turnout. 
Okay, okay. And, and relative to other local government areas as well, perhaps with a small yeah. size, is that? Yeah, very small response rate usually. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you, members. Well, we have more. Oh, you can as much as you want. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm just intrigued then, uh, I mean, in, in the options there when we say, uh, you know, the same number of wards with, you know, minimal, um, you know, variation, but we're dictated by, you know, balancing out the numbers. So uh, was there something around that? Through the presiding member, so what the options paper did in quite a bit of detail was look at what the underlying um, criteria and principles that council has to take into consideration. So quite rightly, it's not just geographic, it's communities of interest, it's topography, there's probably say eight or nine principles and then a whole range of other considerations through the Act. Through that process um, and through the independent analysis, we were able to come up with six options, each of which we thought could work. Um, those six options need to work, not just in present day terms, but they actually need to, as you've also rightly pointed out, this is a long, longer process, so they need to be able to um, keep you within allowable tolerances into sort of that eight year period. So we did forecast the population and we made sure that each of those six options that we put forward could be acceptable into the future. Mm. Come, anyone else, councillors? I assume that this is a consultation is just for noting, um, and um, yeah, we're still going. So yeah, we are. Um, so uh, we, we are just talking about the consultation at the moment. Um, so, councillor Hyde, did you have something further? No, I'll wait for the, the next section of the consultation. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. So through the presiding member, tonight was really about giving you that sense of what, what the community is thinking, um, what feedback they've had, and I think I have already mentioned we're probably fortunate um, that there was a fairly clear indication from the community. Um, there, there are some differences of opinion, like with any consultation, but it is, an, it is a fairly good indication to you of, of where they're sitting. So option two, as we move into what that could potentially look like, this um, plan or this map, as you see, is what was in the options paper. You will see there is a small realignment of the boundary between Central and South Ward. We've really just straightened that out. Um, and it does then enable us to um, get your quotas within tolerance into the future. So this is the option that we're talking about that Council may wish to consider at its next um, meeting in terms of moving forward and what it puts back to the community. In terms of what that would mean, we would suggest that your proposal to the community is that the principal member continues to be elected by the community um, and that the future elected body could comprise, um, I guess, nine councillors, including the Lord Mayor. So, in terms of how that compares to current, your north, you current north ward, you currently have two councillors that would continue. Central, you currently have three councillors that would continue, and south, we would be increasing from two to three. And that's just to recognise that there is a bit of growth happening there. Under this particular scenario, uh, there would be no area councillors. So the reason that that is the case is because to stay with the option of the three wards but also achieve a reduction, an overall reduction in elected members, which is something that came through the consultation, there would be somewhere that you need to lose numbers and the, and the area councillors um, is, is it for this particular option. If council was of a mind that it didn't want to lose its area councillors, it does have the option um, to continue with a, a higher number of elected members. So in, in that case, we would suggest to you that the ward councillors need to fairly well stay the same. Um, the South, again, would increase by one ward councillor, um, but to keep the quotas correct, um, we would need to have that sort of representation. And if you wanted to maintain your area councillors, you could do that by having three. Um, you could potentially do that by having two and showing the community that you've reduced your 
counsellors by one position. Um, once we get down to one area counsellor, I think <coughs> the community and others will probably start to question what's the benefit of one area. So two is probably the absolute minimum, which would only give you that one counsellor position reduction. So that's sort of where the, where the numbers sit um, and how it works out for the quotas. I'm happy to talk about that um, proposal in, in a little bit more detail. Members? Oh. Um, thanks for that. The, and I've just revisited the, uh, the, the original report that was consulted on. Um, and I'm just wanting to ask a couple of questions around the variants of um, North Ward on, I think there's a couple, and any of those, any of those options um, that had uh, the boundary of North Ward staying the same as in just being River Torrens, um, they all had them in 2030 at 16.44% over, over quota. Um, how does that, how does that reconcile with our obligations under the Act? Is there, at what point, because I recall it being mentioned earlier in the piece that um, not only do we have to be in quota now when we do it, but also for a period of time thereafter. What what period of time do we, are we looking at? So through the presiding member, you, you're correct. It does need to be present day and it does need to forecast into the future. Um, I think what we would say about that is um, you're currently out of tolerance now. Um, so you're currently operating under a structure. It, it allows you to, um, plus or minus 10%. I think there are some areas, and we've got the recent numbers, we haven't done them for the supplementary election. Um, so we're looking at that now, but you're currently outside of it. Um, so that, that is a possibility. I think the further we move away from present day, we need to bear in mind that those numbers are projected. Um, so we are making assumptions about population. They are informed assumptions and we have done a lot of due diligence about what we think will happen. But as we all know, COVID and other things, the further that you move away, um, those projections may or not, may, may not be realised. So I think the issue if you are not within tolerance is that you will be written to and the council will be asked to look at that. Um, but I think the options that we've presented could all take you successfully through that period. Yeah, and I think I think this goes to the heart of the conundrum. So when this process first kicked off, we were told by, I think it was Dyer, um, that I think she said 10 years. But having said that, I've gone through the Act um, and I've gone through the Commission's guidelines on how to draft this and I can't find 10 years mentioned anywhere. And so you, you said it's a bit more hey going as to whether or not the Commission is going to actually come and say, well, you're outside of your outside of your tolerance. So just just given that, given that uh, rather unfortunately, we put, I think it was, was it three of the six options had, uh, well, depending on the mix of councils, but at least a couple of them had North Ward at 16% you know, over, but also concerningly, it's not just 16% over in 2030, it's that they're, they're approaching the 10% tolerance in 2026 as well, um, which is obviously only, you know, not that far away in the grand scheme of things. Um, given we've put those options out to consultation um, and, and in doing so sort of baked in um, already uh, a skewed um, representation there, um, I just want to understand a little bit more. So is the Commissioner, is he, is he, if we, if certification occurs, um, if the Commissioner certifies this uh, tomorrow and we're within our tolerance, um, does he, is he not fussed about the projections or does he only care about what they're at in 2026 and doesn't care about what they're at in 2030 or what's, or is it just a bit um, vague, I guess, it's my question. Through the presiding member, sorry if I added to that vagueness. Um, there is a statutory period for reviewing. Um, so my comments were: if it is, if there's something goes wrong, you can look to do that earlier. Um, so hopefully that 
that clarifies that there is a statutory period that it must be done at certain regular intervals. Um, I think for the, the process to be certified, it needs to do a number of things, and it's not just about the variance, it's not just about the numbers, it's not just about where the lines are. It needs to have considered a range of factors. I believe the Commission will look quite strongly at what your community have said as well. Um, so we do need to balance a number of factors, and as I say, I think that there is some, some art involved. There are some assumptions around what will happen into the future. So I think what the Commission will particularly look to is the process and whether Council has actually worked through some reasonable options and whether they sit comfortably with the Council and the community. So I, I guess you know we can focus in on one element of any part of the review, <coughs> but what we need to be mindful of is there are a range of principles and other guiding matters that really will have to inform council's decision making. Um, so I don't know if that assists the council. Um, so the answer is no, it doesn't matter that North Adelaide is 16% over in 2013. That's, that's all I was looking for. Through the presiding member, I can't provide any guarantees of what the commissioner will say um, in terms of certifying the approval. We are comfortable that the options we put forward are based on rigour and that they will take you through to your next, your next process. Um, and just touching on those broader points which you raised, um, I'm just curious, spoke about, as, as you said, more than just more than just numbers and lines on that. Um, regarding communities of interest um, and also, I suppose, communities of economic interest. Does that factor into your drawing of the ward boundaries um, and that sort of thing? Does that feature in, because I'm saying it's, it's a little bit in here, but it's not prominent. Through the presiding member, yes, we have had consideration to those sorts of matters. Um, we did hear some smaller groupings and communities of interest, so that it sort of lends itself to more wards. Um, and then equally, there is the argument at the other end where geographically, the city of Adelaide is not enormous um, and potentially it could just have area councillors. So um, again, it, it's a balance of what are all of the imperatives, but we did turn our mind to that particular issue. And just um, uh, in, in considering that, a couple of things that were sort of mentioned in um, the paper one was, and, and it's in the Act, when you talk about service provision and uh, services being provided fairly to the community, obviously as a capital city, we actually derive the majority of our rates income, or rate of income um, from businesses to the tune of about 75%. Um, if you look at the actual service provision, businesses attract a very small percentage of the services that we as a capital city provide. <coughs> that stands to reason you provide more to the people that live there. Um, uh, which is fine, but I just didn't see any of that captured. And obviously, we are a capital city. I didn't see any of that analysis, um, I suppose, captured in there. So, was there was there some other um, information that underpinned that? Was that something that the administration wasn't particularly forthcoming with? You know, ideas of service provision versus versus you know who's actually paying the rates and, and the splits there, because that didn't feature in the in the consultation. And, and sorry, I suppose that also feeds into when you're thinking about responses, um, how many businesses responded to the consultation compared to how many residents responded to the consultation, which was also the key figure which was missing um, from that. If 99 residents responded, that's fantastic. Um, uh, and one business did, that's not so really keen to look at it in that lens, I, I guess, which is probably a little bit more nuanced to what a suburban council would want to do. through the presiding member. I'll just clarify, is the question, did we turn our minds, mind to where rates are generated and therefore? Yeah, sorry, I guess we hit three questions there in the end. Um, uh, talking about um, fairness and provision of services as outlined, I think it's section 33 of the Act, um, uh, was that considered as in uh, the amount of services that a commercial rate payers access and use compared to the amount of services that residential ratepayers access and use, because we do have some very clearly residential and, and, and non-residential areas. Um, and that falls into the second question, which is if you look at where the rates come from, the vast majority of rates paid in the city actually come from 
the central ward, which is the part of the city which actually receives the, le the least amount by way of service provision. So there's a bit of an inequity there, and the Act obviously talks about fairness and, and equity. Um, so was that considered? And, and then I suppose diving back to the consultation, can we get that split of how many businesses versus residents actually submitted? Okay, through the presiding member, I'm going to attempt to answer those three Sorry. things in one. Um, certainly this issue of the CBD and the business community is something that was raised very early <coughs> to us from elected member discussions. Um, we did turn our minds to when we projected population, we projected based for people, but also for businesses, and we did make different assumptions for those. So it has featured throughout the process, so I would feel confident to say that there has been a rigorous assessment of both your residential and your business communities. I think some of the other issues that you're talking to, while we have to have regard to those matters, what the representation review is trying to do is assess whether people have an access to their council, whether they can participate. Um, so that is not necessarily different depending on what rates you pay and council has other mechanisms and other decisions that it makes in terms of its service provision. So the representation review in and of itself is not determining your service provision. Um, it is looking at whether businesses have fair and equal opportunity to, to get their views heard in the council. So hopefully that clarifies some of that. Someone. Someone. I'll give someone. Members, anyone else? No, Alex, uh, uh, Council Hyder, do you want to add anything further? Um, no, okay. Um, I, I guess I just want to uh, reinforce what Councillor Hyde's saying is that there's like the 89, it is, that actually have participated. It's just really need to have a clarification and clear clearly who are the type of people that have contributed to this because as Councillor Hyde did say, and we keep saying, 77% of our rates do come from businesses. So we want it to be fairly representative of the community as a whole. Um, and I'm, I know that you're saying that 89 is a great number to, to me, and I guess to most of us, it sounds, doesn't sound like a lot for going forward for the next seven years and devising a, um, uh, you know, the structure um, for this. Um, I guess also, um, you know, I, I, I feel that I need a more clearer direction in what, if the commissioner is going to take what the consultation is telling him, I want to know that it's clearly getting the right information from across a range of different ratepayers. And I do understand that your the representation review is about the access in what, uh, you know, the ratepayers are receiving from council. I get what you're saying, but I just want to make sure that it's fairly represented through across different groups, not just one. So, um, so yeah, that's my feedback on that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah thank sorry. you uh, through the presiding member. I should just also um, provide a bit of context. So this discussion point that Councillor Hyde has raised just around uh, where the money comes from and where it goes has been raised a couple of times. Um, over the last sort of year in particular. I should just remind members as well that a fair, you know, it's 52% of our income comes from ratepayers, um, around 30% does come from fees or charges. The majority of that isn't from ratepayers necessarily. Um, and there um, is work that has been underway, and I, you know, do acknowledge it's been slow coming just to better understand uh, the cost of service delivery. So that work has been ongoing for some, uh, some time. But we will come back to the chamber at some point, but it isn't necessarily part of um, the representation review. That's right. That's um, This one's probably really going to throw you, but it was put to me. It was put to me um, by a member in the community that we could have two wards area wide, one ward, all proportional rep, obviously, one ward um, uh, would be voted for by residents and the other one would be voted for by um, uh, businesses and uh, you know, groups and that sort of thing. Um, obviously, the Act doesn't, doesn't appear to contemplate that, but is there anything to your mind that would preclude that from being an option? Often in the city, we talk about whether the Capital City Council can be used as a test bed for 
your ideas and there's, there's nothing in the act that says no but um i just wanted to see if that's something you'd encounter during your through the presiding member there's some complexity with that question um it might not say no but i don't know that it specifically envisages that that sort of use of the act um i think if if you were thinking that sort of model you would be leaning more to an area-based council um and then allowing people to run on their platform and and electing that way um but i'm, I'm not sure that the local government act envisages it and i I wouldn't suggest that the Adelaide City Act does either. Um, through the chair, so just in relation um, to, you know, we have talked over the last couple of years just around some of those tensions between roles and responsibilities the Chamber has under the Local Government Act, which is pure, um, you know, local government um, services, um, which is mainly the residential side to some extent of, of what the council does. And obviously then the role that each council member plays in terms of considering um, uh, projects and everything that we do in the context of a capital city. So you, you are required, all of you, whether you're an area councillor or a ward councillor, to turn your mind um, when you're making decisions um, under the City of Adelaide Act um, and what that means as a capital city council. So I can hear where you're coming from, Councillor Hyde, but um, under the Local Government Act, obviously it doesn't necessarily um, give you the ability to put on your capital city council hat, and that's in the City of Adelaide. Can I ask just where to from here? <coughs> yes, thank you. Um, through Chair, we'll be bringing a report back to the committee on the 6th of July and then to Council on the 13th that will have a recommendation of preferred option and will be if Council resolves on the 13th to go ahead with that option, it'll go out for the second round of consultation which will include public forums for the um, anyone that gives feedback and hopefully then the final resolution will be in September and we'll send it to EXA for certification. So just, just to be clear, um, if the option is not approved on the 30th of July, what to from there? Through the presiding member, your timeframes are running tight. Um, so while you have the ability to consider other um, options and edits, um, you, you may wish to turn your mind to timeframe. If council is not in a position to deliver its representation review within the, the scheduled timeframe, it will either need to seek a formal extension of that time frame, or there is an ability that the Commission could potentially take that over um, and, and do that process for you. So it's it's not as straightforward as just um, having having another go. And so what's the deadline, sorry? The, the ultimate deadline, I believe, for your Gazettal was October. Right. And just to be clear, the, the Council decides on, on this. It's a Council decision through the presiding member. Yes, what we will come back with is a representation report which has the proposed structure. Um, at this point in time, we are suggesting to you that it is option two, that we're now in the options paper. Um, there is rigour in that process. The community has seen that option and there is a level of support for that option. Um, once that goes out in your representation review report, the community has another opportunity to have a say and they can make public representations to you at that time to so come and speak to you um, and then there will ultimately be a decision. So the re representation review report that goes out is not a council decision but we will need a council decision to go back to consultation but you will not be deciding the option at that point. Does that make sense? Sorry, see you. Um, thank you through the chair. Um, that there has been sort of instances in the past, I think the last representation review council did um, offer up different options through that process and certainly consulted again. Um, so, um, but as Sarah said, it won't be your final decision in July. Councillor Hunt. 
and, and, and sorry, through the chair to the um, CEO or whomever, um, was that so, so council then requested further work to be done on different options? Yeah. And, and, that, and the best point to do that would be probably the next council meeting. Is that that's when it's coming in? To just, is that yeah, what Kerry said? It's coming up with discussion of committee and decision option. Yeah, committee and then, yeah. and then the following yeah, council. Right. And then, yeah, so it, instead, what, what, what may be asked for um, procedurally and process wise is um, you, would, you would amend to say, look, we want you to look at these couple of other options. And then they would go and work on that and consult we'll, again. We'll take some advice offline. Um, uh, through the chair, I'll take some advice from Sarah offline whether we, from memory, you do have to go out with something which has gone through that first stage process, i.e., you've gone through sufficient engagement and sufficient rigour in terms of the proposal that you're presenting for the next round of consultation. So through the presiding member, um, that is correct. You do want to follow a logical process. So when we're talking about other options, it depends if the other options are radically different um, or if we are talking about changes of, of streets and, and things like that. So, you know, there is a scale of change that, that is potentially acceptable. My advice to the council is that if a councillor is thinking about another option, they put that forward before committee and let us run some numbers through our model to see if that is actually a viable option. Um, if it is vastly different to the options paper, council could run aground in terms of not completing that first stage of consultation with its community. And, and the, if, if, that was, if that were to occur, and we could go out to consultation and then do this second round of consultation, I'm assuming time is an issue, but because it, it, it appears that the, the desire here is to go through two sets of consultation, one to get initial feedback and then one to hone people's thinking on a, on a final proposal. Is that, the, is that what the process is? Can you clarify that? Yeah. through the presiding member. So the, the first stage is really taking on board the independent assessment. And as we've talked about tonight, there's a range of factors that need to be considered. Um, it was to come up with what viable options for the council are to, to move forward. Um, I'd be interested to hear if there are other options which are also viable in that same context. Um, we think six options was, was a good amount. Um, some councils go out with fewer options, but we think we've provided a very broad cross-section of what the community could potentially be interested in, ranging from just going to area to going to smaller um, wards, which is something that we heard through the consultation that we did with, with the elected members. So um, I think you, you do run a risk if you try to open the process back up to new options that are very different to the six options that have been consulted. And or, yeah. and or very similar to an option that wasn't supported, if that makes sense. So one of the options that didn't. I, I know, but it's hard to say if someone yeah. supports something when they haven't seen it before. That's the problem. And I think um, uh, qualitative feedback now, um, yes, option two, look, if you tell people that you can have exactly the same thing, that's, you know, of course they're going to go from that for that. Um, but that quota problem is, is really, because it actually, in the end of it, it makes over a 20% difference between, you know, someone in, that lives in North Adelaide has their vote matters 20% more than someone who lives in the south of the city. And that's really a, a problem. And I think, yes, it, it stood out amongst the others just, um, but only just. And I think the, the scattered nature of the results sort of tells us which was sort of, I think, council's gut reaction when they saw it. Um, notwithstanding, this is not a criticism of the work. I think, you know, North Adelaide is a heritage suburb. There's not much room for residential growth and what have you, and it's just a nature, it's just a fact of life. Um, uh, but, you know, councillors sort of had a bit of a reaction. So no one really, think, really jumps out at you, I guess. And I think that's the public have the same thing. So, look, I'm just thinking out loud. Um, uh, it's very interesting to see on probably one of the most important things, the process is not exactly set in stone because we do love process and love government, but it is what it is and we look forward to receiving the advice. Thank you. Anything else? Any members? Anyone else? No? Okay, thank you very much.
Uh, we're moving up um, 4.5. Um, we have uh, the Adelaide Economic Development Agency Advisory Committee. We have Ian here, here. and do we have a consultant as well? Kylie. Kylie. Um, you can do a presentation first. Is that on this? Ian? Thanks. Thank you to the Chair. Um, nice to be back in this room again, um, briefing you all. Um, just quickly by way of summary, obviously ADA is up and running and I'd just like to acknowledge and thank a number of the councillors around the table today for the opportunity to meet with you um, and my chair one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you for taking up that offer. That offer obviously remains open in perpetuity. So um, we're always keen to engage. Um, currently have a skills-based board. Um, it's hit the ground running. We've had some new campaigns out in the marketplace, including the Adelaide Long Lunch, which has been really successful and also hit the town, which has just launched. Um, our business plan has been approved by council and went out to consultation, so we're keen to get on uh, with delivering on that. And I think we're due to report to the committee next quarter, so I'll go through a bit more detail then around um, things that we've been working on so you've got even more line of sight. And we currently have seven um, skills-based board members, um, and there are two vacancies on our board. Um, and tonight we really wanted to talk to you about um, the advisory committee process um, and how we do look to appoint an additional board member through that. Um, our charter is quite clear, um, talks about the membership of the advisory committee will be established by the committee's terms of reference and that those terms of reference will be approved by you um, at council. Um, in terms of what we've done in, in terms of the process for uh, reaching some terms of reference or some draft terms of reference. We've engaged an independent facilitator in Collie Ferguson who's been great. We've gone out to about 66 um, stakeholders from memory which have a huge uh, range of diversity from small businesses to consulting firms to some larger businesses. Um, uh, geographical diversity as well as sector diversity in terms of getting to where we have with consultation. Um, I think be honest about that, we've had six, we went out to 66 different groups and we've had about 22 who have actively engaged in the consultation, consultation process to date. So probably would have liked a bit more response from the market on that, um, but I think again the reality is when we did go out for expressions of interest for the AIDA board initially there were 194 applications, which gives you a sense of appetite of people wanting to, to contribute through that process. Um, just in terms of the presentation, I was going to take it as read unless people wanted to draw out anything um, specifically. There are probably a few areas that, that we were very keen to get your feedback on, um, particularly the recommendations on page 9, 10 and 11. Um, page 13 talks about some draft terms of reference, uh, which again we'd love some feedback on. And then there's a page 14 talks about the selection process, because I imagine there'll be some interest in that selection process of um, the board member. And just in terms of some next steps, once we've been through this tonight, um, we'll take on board your feedback and turn that into a report for the committee and then council, hopefully in July, so we'd like to, to keep moving. Um, and then subject to approval of that report and its contents, we'd look to run an AOI process and then the selection process um, by an assessment panel, which again has been outlined in this report, and then for the AIDA board to approve that appointment. So that's a very quick summary of the presentation you have in front of you. Um, very happy to take questions either myself uh, or Carly. Members? I'll move on to the next item if there's no questions. No, no, no. no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't see you. I'm too quick for you. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Councillor Penal. Um, uh, just as uh, with the uh, term for those that are going to be on, uh, on this advisory board, uh, what is the length of term that you're sort of looking at uh, for them to be on there? Um, through the chair, it's uh, what's been uh, recommended here in terms of reference is a one-year appointment and that the chair of the advisory committee would be the board member on AIDA. Um, and that would be a one-year term and up to three consecutive terms so they can re-nominate up for up to three years. So you're saying that uh, for the the board members, they'll be every year they'll uh, be up for re-election, or, or however you're. 
the, so the advisory <coughs> committee, no, sorry, through the chair, the advisory yes. committee board member would be annual through, yeah, sorry, I'm using the wrong word. through the advisory committee <coughs> would be annual and they would be able to be reappointed at the mm -hmm. vote of the advisory committee uh, for up to three terms. And the actual committee members, sorry, that's where I was actually heading rather than support, my apology. Uh, so the committee members, how, what's their term of, uh, uh, to be on the committee? Same? Well, so everything's one year. Sorry, through the chair. Sorry, through the chair, the same. Okay. Um, so, and uh, I, I see the, the, the makeup, um, just as, a, as a, I suppose, a, a comment that, uh, uh, so you're still seeing a little bit as a skill based board in some of the commentary in here? Um, yes, we certainly are. And I think that would be consistent with the consultation process that Kylie has undertaken too. There was a fairly strong appetite um, to remain skills based, but um, also recognising the diversity of our businesses across the CBD. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, is that would that take precedence over the diversity? Is it so? Because I mean, you already have a skill-based board that sits on top, and underneath that, you have obviously an administration that is highly professional. Underneath that is that you're now trying to deal with, um, you know, the various stakeholders. Um, so uh, we already have a skill-based board. So it's more how is that is going to engage with the stakeholders better and really make the the, the other two uh, components more effective. Uh, through the chair, from understanding that question correctly, I think um, for refer to page thirteen, um, we've talked about the advisory yeah. committee membership. Um, so representatives from the precinct groups as a collective, we think that's an important principle um, in connecting to some of the smaller businesses around the city. We have talked about a small business representative, then we've talked about through this consultation phase, representatives from a range of sectors, but that wouldn't be at the expense of being skills based, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and as in the meetings, uh, I mean, I suppose if they're going to be a conduit for uh, communication, then they should either be, depending on what you're looking from them for, either before uh, an either board meeting to uh, advise of the ideas on the agenda or after the uh, AIDA board meeting, that it uh, it takes away the, the conversation and the initiatives and actually can translate that, uh, you know, as actions uh, for the stakeholders. So. Yeah, I suppose that's not a question as much as a, as a, as a comment. Um, and yeah, the precinct groups, so the, it's imagined to have one member of the precinct for the, uh, representing their precinct groups on this. And um, so it's all one term. I find that a little bit short just because of being able to stagger uh, skills and, and, and uh, people. So I just as a, as a comment that you know you want to have, a, have some sort of stability within the, uh, uh, the the committee so that you know you're always um, you always got some a group there that have uh, a con some continuity that they can pass on because otherwise you may have a whole bunch of new people which means you're you're not really getting good value out of something that should be a conduit to to the um, you know the basic businesses at the, at the bottom end and uh, yeah, no, no, just the, the comment that it's mainly more, for me, more skewed towards a representative group because you wanted to be able to comment and act on the decisions of, of the uh, AIDA board uh, because that's more about the process of that and, and, and getting feedback. So whether that's, uh, you know, the main purpose of it rather than necessarily being another group of, of people uh, advising on the same group of people that are doing the strategy, you're asking for more of about an interaction rather than necessarily a, a, a complementary a group of people that are just going to comment on this rather than being this is what we're thinking how will it work will your stakeholders uh, uh, feel this is uh, right for us and, and enable us to uh, you know to get the best value so that you get the most you know quick response rather than another co uh, conversation that's for the moment Members. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I suppose, look, I've, I've, I've read through it all and I, and I understand um, some of the thoughts um, on it. I, I suppose what what I, as the as one of the movers of, of the initiative, was looking for is something that um, hasn't been uh, done in Adelaide before, and that is the wholesale engagement of small businesses. Um, and I just 
I worry, I worry that, um, that this won't deliver that necessarily. So, um, but look, I want to. I'd like to give. I'd like to give the uh, managing director an opportunity to just flesh out who, who exactly would you envisage? Because um, part of the point, part of the point of, of the exercise is bringing the terms of reference back to council, so that council could have some um, satisfaction and confidence in who who exactly. Yeah, and that's not names necessarily, but that's the particular species of people that we're putting on there. Is it someone from this, someone from that? Um, obviously, at the time, there was a lot of discussion around precinct groups. And um, look, I'm not sure if they've all submitted or if they didn't, but if they didn't, then that's a, that's a shame. And these things are determined by those that turn up. So I'm just curious through you, Chair, as to what would, who would be on there in, a, in an ideal world, the types of classes of people? Um, and what would they be advising on? What is what is your interpretation of the role of the committee? Um, thank you, through the chair. Uh, in terms of what they're advising on, the charter is reasonably clear on that. It's, it basically talks about anything within the remit of AES charter. So that there are basically four or five key result areas for us around investment attraction, marking the city as a whole, um, the Rundle Mall piece. Um, and residential growth and the visitor economy. So that's if, if, sorry. If, if I may, sorry. But practically speaking, yeah. practically speaking, and, and um, you've been operating for a few months now. So, um, uh, from your experience of operating now for a little while, and you know, you're by no means done, I'm sure, in ironing out exactly what what, is, what the agency itself is doing. But based on what you've done over the last few months. You know, are there examples where you might think, oh, we've got this new program or we're doing this new thing and it would have been great to have some input from the advisory committee on the rollout of it, the operation of it, the implementation or even earlier in the piece, what exactly it looks like and could be a tweak. Like, is that something something practical? Um, just back to the chair, I think this is a fine line between the skills-based board and being involved in operational issues of an organisation. Um, the current board, highly skilled, have got excellent backgrounds in, in a raft of sectors. I think uh, my, my professional view, um, and it's all subject to who will respond to the expression of interest at the end of the day, but there are probably a couple of areas that I'd love to see some extra skills around the board. I think um, change management and pace of change, the things that are going on in, our, in, in the ecosystem out there are moving quickly. So some skills that, that really play to um, new technologies, new thinking, uh, adaptation quickly. I think that's probably based around small businesses too, so the SME piece. So there's, there are a lot of S out of the SMEs in the city of Adelaide, and that voice is really, really important. And I think it's important for the board, it's important for, for my management team, so I'm close to that, important for the management team. So we don't want to lose sight of, of what some of the difficulties that small businesses will be going through. Um, you know, coming off the back of COVID, we've been set up to be nimble, we've been set up to, to get on with things. So I think that the, the advisory committee can play a really, really important role around maybe some of those more granular issues that are happening um, almost straight in at business level, because I think that would be invaluable for us as an organisation. I'd hate to, sorry, Cass, I'd hate to just name um, individuals or businesses in that, in that no, sense, no but that's, that's my feel. So if we think about the, the, the advisory uh, committee, um, if, if one of the roles that it could play, and I think it should play, uh, is that uh, effective communication with, with, that, with all those particular groups and how would you do that effectively? Um, because if, again, if you have individual businesses specifically, then their communication levels may not be uh, as, as uh, good as it should, could be uh, to uh, bring the, these initiatives down. So how would you see that communication that, uh, that you are you're assisting the small businesses um, and using this as, as one of those mechanisms, considering you've got a lot of, uh, uh, you know, um, particularly peak uh, industry bodies and things like that, that have a lot of members across many different sectors within the city. Um, and they have, a, have a, an infrastructure. So if that's one of those conversations, but how will you effectively translate what you're trying to do as quickly as possible and to be nimble? Through the chair, and thank you for the question. It's a really good one. I think that's why on that slide 13, we've actually talked about, I think this would be one of the first things we'd be charging the advisory committee with about um, the way that they would like to be communicated with or the way they would like to communicate back in through the board. So that's why I think we've tried to collect 
uh, things like a representative from the precinct groups, the small business representative. We've picked a range of sectors that we know are, are really important to the city, so education, retail, uh, culture, arts, health and wellbeing, which is such a, a growing part of our economy, that entrepreneurial cyber technology and youth space. I think the youth one again is another, is another element um, and uh, Councillor, we went to 40 under 40 things just the other night and you can see there's, there's a huge amount of uh, untapped potential in, in that youth side of the city and I'm not sure, I'm not sure through the current construct we're tapping into that as well as we could. So again, uh, that's why we've got these um, sort of membership suggestions that they do comprise those sorts of elements, which is on that page 13. So I think part of that, that group, they will, they will pick up ideas, they will pick up ways that they want to be communicated with rather than how we may have traditionally communicated to, um, to those sectors. guidelines that we already have in place um, that's come back into council for discussion. Um, I would say that we've seen this before and then we'll take this as read. Uh, and if anyone has any discussions, uh, questions in regards to it, please let me know and bring it forward. Anyone else? You want a preamble? Yeah. Okay. Would you like to just discuss a few points on that, Matthew? Uh, good evening members and through the chair. So thanks for the opportunity to run through uh, a reduced um, version of what's in your packs uh, tonight. Um, I'd also like to uh, welcome uh, Kate, uh, she brought me with the presentation tonight. Um, just that works. So by way of background, in 2018 Council uh, requested that uh, the Green City Plan be put together. It was uh, endorsed by Council uh, in November, oh, sorry, September of 2018 as a three-year guideline or a three-year plan. So that does expire this financial year. Um, the plan was on the back of extensive consultation that occurred uh, both internally uh, and externally with uh, professional bodies and the elected body at the time. So the purpose uh, of the Green City Plan uh, context um, recognises the urgent need for climate change resilience uh, for our city trees and plants. Uh, it recognises the challenges and the constraints of planting trees in uh, locations within a city context. And uh, as stated, uh, noting that this is not a strategy, this is actually a guideline uh, document. Um, and has since uh, transferred in part through other council decisions, uh, through uh, other expectations as far as uh, canopy covers and tree planting numbers, but that wasn't the purpose of, of this initial plan, which we'll go through in a bit more detail shortly. So uh, it's more so a design principles uh, document and a typology document. So um, it isn't an implementation plan, nor is it a costed plan. So I'll hand over to Kate to run through the principles of the document. Thank you, Matt. Um, so the following principles are outlined in the Green City Plan and these uh, underpin uh, the implementation of green infrastructure initiatives to achieve real and lasting benefits for the City of Adelaide. Um, so by creating a connected network of greening, um, we need to encourage integrated green infrastructure systems connecting across the city and that includes private gardens, um, our green walls and green roofs. Um, we need to reinforce the urban character across the city um, with its unique structure and identity. Um, and this includes uh, precincts and parks, open spaces and streets, um, and requires thoughtful approaches to greening. We need to harness the multiple functions of greening by um, adding value by using infrastructure that performs multiple functions 
So for example, um, shade and shelter and wayfinding can be in, in, included as greening. Traffic calming and stormwater management can um, have greening overview, overlays as well. Um, to create conditions for success and longevity of greening, we need to provide the right conditions to enable the successful implementation of green infrastructure and to realise that the cost benefits for the long term asset management. We need to create value with welcoming spaces um, and this includes enhancing the social economic and economic value by using green infrastructure to create beautiful, comfortable and inviting public spaces for people. We need to integrate tree planting strategies and greening across the city and consider all stages of public space design, implementation and asset management. And we need to maximise the seasonal benefits of greening. So there is a seasonal role that, um, and benefits that street trees and plantings provide and we need to maximise these, uh, particularly on our high activity streets and enhance our building performance. We're also looking to create a continuous tree canopy across the city. Um, so we're talking about connected, where you have an avenue of trees and the, and the tree canopies connect, um, which benefits people by reducing heat on the streets and reducing that heat island effect, uh, creates cooler microclimates and habitat benefits, and also beautiful city streets. Uh, Principle number nine there is to use greening to improve the human scale of streets. So this is where we can use street trees and the planting pallets to provide that human scale and visual interest in the public realm. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, harnessing stormwater for healthier streets. The, um, we can use water sensitive urban design where possible to treat and use stormwater uh, and ensure healthier streets in the long run. And obviously that, um, reduces our reliance on potable water. And number 11 there is to apply best practice. So engaging with research in green infrastructure technology where possible. So greening across the city takes many forms and in a city environment, we need to take all opportunities we can to integrate greening wherever possible. Um, in your longer pack of slides, you see on slide seven, there are many benefits of greening. These include the economic benefits. Um, there's a lot, lots of research out there showing uh, by having a street tree or greenery out the front of a business provides um, that benefit immediately back to the business. Um, another benefit is to enhance the character and identity of a precinct. There are obviously environmental <coughs> benefits, health and wellbeing to our residents and city worker population. Uh, the obvious safety benefits of having um, well-used uh, well public spaces because they're safe and greener, um, and then the social benefits that come in hand with that. So the, the large piece of work that sits in the Green City Plan is around the planting pallets. Uh, so there's an, um, uh, a number of pallets for trees and understory plants. Um, so the use of greening is critical to moderate our city temperature, especially with our long, hot, dry summers. Um, we need to provide shade and those cooling effects. So, but it's equally important to ensure that street trees and plants are contextually appropriate to Adelaide to promote its character and reflect our heritage. Uh, so the street tree, tree selections that are in your slide pack from slide 11 onwards, they're being defined by street typology. Um, and this considers the scale of the street and the built form on those streets and the character of that precinct. The street tree palettes that are included include exotic and native trees as also, and also deciduous and evergreen species. Um, the species diversity um, increases in those palettes, increases as the scale of the street decreases. So what that means is for the civic and ceremonial boulevards, such as North Terrace or um, Grote Street, where we've got really wide street sections, we want larger, larger scale trees and we want a more legible um, palette of street trees on those, on those large streets. 
The narrower streets and laneways have a much broader palette of trees and plants. And this is so that we can tweak those to reflect the local character precincts. Uh, those understory planting palettes and the planting design styles are provided to reflect each of those defined character precincts and they've been selected to showcase a range of scale, form, foliage and colour, flowers, low water and maintenance requirements. And they also include a mix of exotic and native species. Um, and as I mentioned, all those um, typologies and planting palettes are listed in your slide pack. So that includes example tree species and typical street sections. So this is uh, just a snapshot of the challenges and constraints that we're looking at in a city street versus in a parklands environment. Um, and again, I'll highlight the there is a difference between working in a city street versus um, some of our neighbouring suburban councils. Um, I've worked on some projects where you might have four, six teleco, telco lines and it's almost impossible to get to squeeze a tree in. Um, so this is a very simplified section of what it looks like in real life terms under the ground. We've got all kinds of underground services there, um, sewer, power, water, gas, plus the telcos. What isn't on here is overhead power lines, um, awnings, verandas. We've also got redundant services when you're looking to get a tree and you, you don't know if you're finding a live service or something that's been left there. Um, and all of these challenges really do add up to a high cost per tree in, a, in our city streets. Um, and again, it's, it's very different when you look at other locations around Adelaide. Thanks, Kate. So uh, by way of update uh, from 2018, uh, since the uh, plan was endorsed, uh, on the screen is a timeline of uh, projects that have been completed, uh, adopting the principles uh, from the Green City Plan. That uh, total uh, number of trees so far equates to 268 trees that have already been planted uh, with this year, uh, adding another 32, which is a total of 300 trees. Um, over the, the two and a half odd year period since it was endorsed. Um, that number excludes all the uh, trees that were being planted through uh, the parklands. Uh, so this is just street tree uh, projects. Um, beyond 2021, um, there's no specified budget. However, uh, the renewal program uh, would look where possible to introduce any trees into each of those projects uh, as they, they come up. Um, and we'd certainly be looking for additional uh, third party funding uh, to help complement uh, this program. So just some examples on the screen. We have Growth Street, which uh, included another 44 significant trees that planted in the median plus the understory plantings. Um, so there's an example of a uh, main boulevard um, or a ceremonial um, avenue. Um, a more infill type uh, example uh, on the screen looks at water sensitive urban design. That's a project that's underway or near completion, um, which has uh, curb inlets uh, that feed uh, the trees in underground um, storage um, wells to obviously feed the trees and, and reduce the, the reliance on the water supply. <coughs> So next steps, um, as per the motion, uh, we'll be preparing a report and bringing it back to council, uh, likely September, October, uh, to look at the current status of the greening efforts uh, in regard to the uh, increased tree canopy cover. Um, the reason for the timing around that is uh, we have some lighter uh, survey that we need to compare to 2018 to see how much growth uh, we've had over the years. Um, we can also look at the potential partnerships and bring that back in a report as well. Uh, as stated, uh, we can look at uh, ways of uh, increasing our street trees through our renewal program. Um, we can look at other um, uh, events uh, with our place and events team as well. Um, in the same report in September or October, we'll be, look at, we'll be looking at um, how to investigate, investigate ways to increase greening opportunities through 
um, the different uh, constraints that we have, which includes sort of car parks uh, that need to, so obviously the 300 trees that have been completed to date, I would class as the quick wins, uh, where we're away from services, we're away from car parks, uh, and we can achieve those. The next steps will be a little bit harder. We need to investigate those with a bit more detail around um, what are the constraints as far as services in ground in the car park and that it may impact. Uh, so we can uh, come back with the uh, constraints around that. And then uh, we can look to a future uh, green city plan uh, or an implementation plan. What does that look like in future years? So that will come back in sept September, October. Thank you. Councillor Kimmer. Well, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, just in relation to the large trees, uh, the selection you've got outlined here, um, I personally uh, really welcome the uh, deciduous uh, elements. I think that uh, colours and the diversity, uh, particularly the change of colour, the change of season, uh, is something that's generally um, quite uplifting uh, for the uh, public. Um, but there's been I think um, a few of the councillors, there's been some concerns raised that the shift um, from constituents, um, some concerns raised the shift uh, in particular uh, away from plain trees and hackberry trees uh, might see a decline in the canopy size, in particular the uh, spread of the canopy that uh, uh, might be the overall average result. Um, what would you say to that, that concern? Uh, through the chair, um, as stated, uh, we'll be looking at the LIDAR survey from uh, 2018 through to current. Uh, we'll see if that has any impact on um, the current planting and, and what has happened today. Um, as far as species selection, uh, not my area of expertise, um, hence Kate is here, uh, but um, uh, we can certainly look at uh, the, the types of trees that are in the current plan and uh, we can bring um, something back in regard to that in uh, the, the next report. Okay. Um, through the chair, um, the planting pellets do actually take into account, we do have a high um, population of trees in like hackberries and plane trees and ash trees, as you've mentioned, um, and we are looking to diversify that species pellet. So the, the, green, the green seed plan does talk to that. Um, obviously that's for climate change, resilience and um, uh, disease and pest resilience as well. You know, we'd hate to get something that wipes out a large percentage of our street tree population. Yeah. Um, in terms of canopy, I mean, you could argue that uh, plane trees, ash trees, and hackberries are deciduous, and therefore the canopy of a evergreen is is actually more beneficial. Um, yeah. You get that shading and cooling effect all year round. It also reduces. Um, leaf litter and um, our uh, requirement to street sw sweep the streets more regularly yeah. um, and blocking stormwater and that sort of thing. Yeah. Just just to follow up on that point, you'd have to recognise that the deciduous tree, uh, the canopy is present in summer um, mm -hmm. and not in winter, and so the canopy is present when it's most needed, which is which is summer. But I guess we're, if I can convey to you, if it's, if it's possible to just get a sense of, I mean, understandably, there's trade-offs and all these things. Um, if, there's, if, if we are to see a loss of canopy spread uh, because of shifts uh, in species away, particularly from plants uh, and hackworms, it'd be good to get a sense of whether that's actually quantified, so we can mm. we, we we know that that's what we're trading off uh, in, 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 from the future, and so that can be avoided where possible. Um, I, I think if canopy spread can be maintained uh, where possible on the bigger streets, that's obviously <laughs> going to be a virtue. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hyde. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the informative presentation. I think um, in the first instance, I want to get a bit of an idea of what exactly it is that we're looking at and what exactly has guided the council's, the administration's decision making um, with regards uh, to what gets planned, where I understand the logic. Um, um, behind all that's all very good. But when it said, the slide on there said that the council endorsed the plan. Um, and this was one of the problems when the whole gum tree saga emerged. It was that it did have a policy, but it wasn't really a policy. It was 
it was a green city plan, but it wasn't like a normal plan, like you would get bound up and have it sitting there in the customer service center. It was just some slides. Um, notwithstanding, it's very good and there's a lot of work into it. So I'm just, uh, did, 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 did council, because it looks like just something that came to a workshop, like what we're considering right now. Um, so my question through you, Chair, would be, um, did council actually endorse it? Because the words on there were endorse. And so I just want to understand, like, the earlier version of this, which which is what was circulated at the time of the gum tree saga, um, was that specifically endorsed by a decision of council, or was it just given in committee and feedback was sort on it? Um, that's just my first question. Uh, Matthew, CEO. Okay. Uh, I don't. Yeah. CEO. Okay. So, um, from memory, through the presiding member, it was considered as part of the Adelaide Design Manual, but just to matter, you have to clarify, or Kate. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, uh, yes, it's our understanding that um, as part of the Adelaide Design Manual, and, and that is a, a guideline. Um, this was this is a, a section of that manual um, but it was a specific request that came through as a council report and was endorsed separately uh, by council decision as a plan not as a strategy okay. does that clarify no it doesn't no? it really doesn't but thank you for the uh, i'm not saying the answer is deficient i'm just saying i've got no idea um, what the process is behind it. And that sort of feeds into the point that I'm going to make now, um, which is that uh, uh, greening and the public realm and trees um, is what, you know, if we have 300,000 people come into the city every day and 20,000 people that live here, um, that's what people engage with and appreciate the most. Um, and I, I, I do really think um, uh, that we need a little bit more public input in it. I'm not, I'm not questioning um, uh, the expert advice um, or what have you, as Councillor Kira said, there's a trade-off in all things um, when you put one tree uh, or shrub in over another. Um, uh, but I do think the public have a certain expectation around, and it is in many ways an aesthetic expectation, and that expectation needs to be balanced against um, uh, environmental and, and, and just feasibility of infrastructure and what have you. Um, but I do really think it's, it's one of the most important things. We'll consult on the drop of a hat, but we, we, we haven't yet gone out to open consultation and ask people the sort of greening that they want to see in their city. Um, and the reason, I, the reason I just give that feedback, and I hope to see that in this process somewhere, um, uh, is because there, there are certain things that I would like to see incorporated into it. Um, one of them I was just showing uh, Director Devonish. Um, is, uh, and it was on there as well, although there weren't any examples given, um, uh, is the example of, I think it was, was it living architecture that was on there? Was that the term used? Living architecture. Now, um, it's all well and good for us to go down um, uh, Grove Street and plant 40 trees um, and what have you, uh, but what about the smaller streets in the city? And I'm looking at the heat map and I'm looking at um, uh, Southport, and I'm actually I'm looking at the northwest of the city as well, where there are lots and lots and lots of little laneways. Um, uh, they're laneways that often have power lines in them, um, which in, in an ideal world would be undergrounded, but that's very expensive. Um, uh, they're laneways which are not DDA compliant. They have um, footpaths that are barely a metre wide, and, and so because of that, as you would have found, um, they're not laneways that can support your conventional greening um, uh, methods of just whacking in a tree and you know putting in some fronts around it. Um, and so things like living architecture and how we can counterbalance, counterbalance that I think would be quite innovative. Um, uh, I, I don't want to I don't want to touch on it too much, but it, it captured my imagination, even if the implementation I think <laughs> from the, the Northern Territory government wasn't quite spot on, but I'm referring to their shade structure um, in the city of Darwin, which you know, similar probably to the Bohem greening issues, um, where when you're doing living architecture, you can really run into issues that you didn't expect because you're doing something, something that hasn't been done before. This $2.7 million um, shade structure has run into many, many, many issues. Um, uh, but I'd be fascinated to learn um, of how they fix those issues. And I'd be really interested to know if our administration can look at that topic overall. Um, to see what sorts of living architecture we can bring into the city because 
It doesn't all have to be trees, and indeed trees won't fit everywhere, as, you, as you've outlined. Um, and those are some of the things as well that I'd like our community to engage on um, uh, through you, Chair, and, um, and, and also some engagement with, and I, and I know we already do, but other other bodies, you know, there's plenty of landscape architects out there who would love to have an opinion on everything, but you know, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's valid as well. Um, uh, so, and, and just um, one more thing, and just something that um, uh, pegged in my mind, I'm conscious that you know, we're spending a lot of money on um, uh, conduits and what have you in our upcoming asset management plans. There's millions of dollars there next year for that. Um, uh, do, do, the, do the standards that we apply um, uh, to those sorts of infrastructure renewals, do they bring in, do they take account of, um, well, they make allowance for if we want to put trees in somewhere? So if, if you're going and renewing stormwater, um, for example, are you going to put that a little bit further away or put it put it out of the way so that you can have more space for trees? Is that something we think about? Uh, thank you, Anthony, for the chair. Um, we're restricted uh, by way of the service authorities as far as offsets. Um, there's got to be a certain distance between a NBN conduit versus a SAPN conduit versus water versus sewer. Uh, obviously, we've got a little bit of flexibility with our stormwater um, as far as its lateral location, um, but our depth then becomes um, a critical part. So, um, yes, we try and accommodate where we can when we're adjusting services, but we are fixed by a lot of other service authorities. And, and I know that's a, that's a uh, that's an issue we may not be able to 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 fix, and we just have to live with. But in the in the administration's view, is it worth engaging them and the state government um, um, with a view to allowing? What, look, you know, it's, it's only going to get hotter. Um, uh, so, is it worth engaging? With them to think about how we may be able to change some of those requirements. And, and I'm no expert, but are they are they just perfunctory requirements? Are they actually necessary for the infrastructure to operate? Those those sorts of questions. I'd be interested to know whether that's something, and we can look at in collaboration with them going forward. Sorry, um, through the chair, just a couple of the questions that you've asked. We are already doing some work. Um, with the infrastructure and sustainability together uh, in terms of um, we support a PhD students looking very much at these specific issues, uh, the issues that Matt's been talking about um, as well to really understand what these issues are for the city and then put those cases to those all those infrastructure providers, the SAPNs, etc. We've also been looking at living architecture types of projects as well. It specifically, we'll have a project going in Grace 2, Grand Street Green is the project where we're putting in screens because, as Kate has indicated, we just don't have space mm -hmm. underground. So screens with green living, um, you know, provided on those is where are some of the types of things that we'll be looking at. But we did have a, a presentation that came to council some time ago where you had looked at living architecture type things um, as things that we could be investigating. So we started on that journey, including talking to some of the universities. Thank you. And just a very, a very quick final point. The, the, the main point I just wanted to draw attention to it again was going out to consultation on the plan, the policy, the strategy, the, the whatever, um, so the public can have a say on what they prefer. One thing that I, I really would have enjoyed um, uh, is if we actually had as well, I know there was a bit of an example of exemplar of the canopy, types of canopy. Um, I'd love to see a canopy rating if one exists for all the various types of trees and you could do it at various times of the year. Um, but that's something that I think would be really, really interesting um, to look at. And if it went out in a consultation, it, it, I think it would heavily inform people's views. Thank you. Um, Clinton, you had something to clarify? Yes. Uh, through the presiding member, um, just to clarify your previous point, Councillor, um, and I think we'll take on board the community consultation aspect of um, bringing a report back to Council. I think that's a really good point. Um, just whether the, um, the Green City Plan was endorsed or approved by Council, um, the decision of Council on the 11th of December, uh, September 2018, was to approve the update to the Adelaide Design Manual, including revised draft palette um, of street trees and understory planting. So I th we are working to improve all the council document. I think that's a clarification. 
Councillor Boom today. My question was answered because I felt that it was my mental connection to the crease. Okay. Any other councillors, members? I just want to make a few points. Um, I think this is a motion that I brought through, so thank you um, for, for, for the work that has gone into that. And I can see that it has been a lot of work that has gone into it. But to the point of um, Councillor Carer, I think um, people are looking for an experience when they come and visit the city. And, and I think the beautiful deciduous trees gives a very emotive um, feel. And um, I, um, I'm, I understand uh, gum trees, in my opinion, uh, belong in the parklands or in the bush. I don't believe they belong on a boulevard. Um, I don't believe that they offer a very a nice aesthetic appeal to the city. And if that's what we're creating, we're creating entrances. But that's my opinion. And if we're going out to consultation, maybe there's more people that might agree with that. I, I hope so, but that is just my opinion. Um, I um, just make a note that in part of, uh, it was in the paper, how green is your suburb? Um, and if you look at Adelaide uh, back in 1990, 1991 versus 2018, 2019, we actually haven't really moved much in green. Um, so it, that really concerns me and uh, it, it really, I understand that we're doing a lot of work and we're identifying that, but it just goes to show that we need to do more work. And I believe that we need to choose the right trees and again, that gives the canopy um, effect that Councillor Kira is talking about. And if we're looking at, you know, very hot summers, it creates a very cooling effect and you know our roads do get hot and uh, we want to you know make sure that we are cooling our city down and that's what's important so i think choosing the right species i would like to move away from gum trees on on main streets um i don't believe they belong on the suburban area and i work in, there's other species like i haven't seen like tulip trees i don't know if that was mentioned in, in, there, in there at all i'm sure there's so many other species that we could choose from to um it, for our city um I um, I think that would be the point that I would want to make um, in, in regards to that. Um, you know, it's I think we really need to move towards a really good planning of our city, greening it up. It is an important part for the future. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you. I'm moving to... Um, uh, 4.3, uh, we have the Adelaide Town Hall uh, Future Direction. Oh, just one moment. <laughs> See? We need a motion to adjourn. Uh, so who's pulling? Okay, Councillor Henry today. Councillor Kira. Would anyone like to speak to the motion? Oh, I mean, let's vote. Okay. And uh, five minutes.
Members, we are back. We are on um, item 4.3, um, the Adelaide, Adelaide Town Hall Future Direction. Um, would you like to speak to this, Christy? Very briefly, thank you through the chair. Hello everyone, good evening members. Uh, let me first say, I'm just going to take it as read and hold, on to, hold us on a specific slide that I'll talk to briefly. Um, I think we might all agree that the Adelaide Town Hall is a grand dame. Her iconic stature and grandeur make her a sought after venue for high level private functions and weddings. Right now, she is also currently Adelaide's best concert hall and provides rich musical experiences for some of Australia's best orchestras and ensembles. Uh, I'm joined tonight by <coughs> Anne and Chrissy, and uh, we're going to talk you through, uh, seek your, your thoughts, because in 2019, we presented you with a briefing about the Adelaide Talk Town Hall operations in confidence. At this presentation, you acknowledged that there was an imbalance of commercial and community activity and asked us if we, this could be considered going forward. Well, we've taken, undertaken a comprehensive internal uh, review, operational review of the town hall and have observed that the venue has never really been fully utilised. Not just because of COVID, but because our model has been catering locked and cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. A change of catering contractor has enabled us to look at this now new model. So tonight we seek your thoughts on a new model that balances civic, cultural and commercial activity. We believe we can provide a catering contractor an attractive opportunity to secure events in this spectacular location, whilst also confirming cultural activity, more use of the meeting rooms and other rooms, more music and artistic endeavours and more flexibility around using local catering options. We see the Town Hall as an extraordinary cultural hub that simply requires more activity. We would like your thoughts on our suggestions for the booking categories that we seek to introduce, as well as your thoughts on making the Town Hall home to say some key companies that support us UNESCO City of Music objectives. Uh, if you'd like us to talk through any of the presentation we can, but otherwise, we seek your thoughts. Thank you. Oh, I'm sure. Um, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Hyde would love to hear it all, but we'll continue to take oh, it as bread. Oh, sorry. No. No? Councillor Hyde? Yeah, Did you have a question? No, no, no. no. I, I oh. thought you'd finish. Apologies. I have, oh, I thought you'd oh. have to continue with the presentation. No. no oh, okay. oh, oh, yeah. I that. Councillor Hyde. Thank you. Sorry. No, I just did feedback, oh, if I may. Feedback. If I may. Um, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for this. I think it's. I think it's um, very good. Um, uh, feedback. Well, generally, generally positive. I, I do think um, you should always just be looking to increase those percentages on the page. Uh, my page numbers come up. It's your slide eight, I think. Um, you should always be looking to increase that. Um, I, I do think, and um, you know, I, I know, I know, we seek to, to, to save money wherever we can, um, particularly at the moment. But I, I, I do also think, if we look at this um, presentation in the context of Councillor Kouros's recent motion as well, um, uh, we, 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 I, I would hope through the CEO and the chair that you would have the ability and, and feel that you have the standing to consider any um, enhancements to parts of Town Hall, um, because there are parts of it, and I'm thinking about the you know, the bathroom upstairs on that side, um, which is inadequate and requires, requires renewal. Um, I'm thinking about the, the Prince Alfred room, which is a little bit drab. Um, it's fine, it's a little bit drab. Uh, and, and those sorts of things. So I, I would encourage you to, to, to Think about how some investment in that could actually really help drive um, uh, usage of this place. Um, the uh, the uh, and I've had you know I've had complaints about the green room not being adequate enough and also bump in and bump out as well, needing to do that sort of through the back rooms and the kitchens and what have you. And, and so I'd really encourage you to work through those issues so that we can get those those events coming in here easily and we can be an even more reputable 
place for those events to be held. And it's all about driving revenue, don't, don't worry. It's activation, but also driving revenue. Um, the, other, the other aspect of it as well, and something which would give you an instant bounce on these figures um, today, and I acknowledge it would require a, an amendment to the standing orders, but um, anecdotally, yeah. I understand we get many inquiries about using the Queen Adelaide Room. The Queen Adelaide Room is, of course, only used um, for civic functions, which means the vast majority of the time it sits there um, not being utilised. It is a room that I believe $750,000 was spent on, which is lovely. Um, and I appreciate it's not just for councillors, um, it is for the community as well. We welcome them in there too. Uh, but I, I see no reason why that room would not be would not be letable, you know, casual letable space for someone doing an event. Um, and so I would encourage you to think about that as well, that it could be a premier space and obviously the civic functions would take absolute precedence over that, but otherwise it's just, and we don't even let people in to look through it, really, we just have to poke through the door and the tools. Um, it's, their, it's their room, for you to say. Um, um, and the, the, other, the, the final, the final um, two points I'll make, again, in, in the context of the recent motion, um, uh, and I think this could give you an instant lift, is um, uh, the members lounge is prime space, which I think, if, if I may, yes. the, the members lounge is prime space, which um, is, is monopolized by only us as councillors. Um, that shouldn't be the case. It should be space for the community. Um, uh, there's, there's no, you know, councils often boast that the table that Colonel Light designed the city of Adelaide on is sitting there in that room. It's, it's wonderful that it's in there, but it's in there with a couple of placemats on it, stashed away, and councillors occasionally meet on there or have a meeting there once a week. I mean, it should be in a museum, if anything. These are the sorts of spaces that I think we could activate um, uh, for the community. Uh, consequently, as well, um, councillors' offices, which must only be occupied, physically occupied, you know, two percent of the time, um, that provides that could provide a lot of space um, for a couple of in my view, smaller Queen Adelaide room style rooms, not as opulent, but smaller rooms that could be used for conferences, that could be used for um, space for the community for free um, uh, to come and to come and have their little meetings and what have you. That that would be my vision on how to get all these um, categories um, in, increased patronage. Um, uh, I do think council offices should be, they're, they're not necessary. We can go somewhere else, we can go upstairs. They don't really use them. That's prime community space, um, and also the members' lounge is, is just is not necessary um, uh, anymore. It's it's used for not even half a percent of the time that it is there existing. Um, it's got community assets in it which have substantial heritage value, um, uh, including that table. Uh, and th those are those are my views and, and used to bring other people in, please. See uh, thank you. So through the through the chair, just to be clear, um, the team in front of you tonight is purely responsible for the Adelaide Town Hall and not the civic um, areas. Um, and so, as you indicate, Councillor Hyde, any review of those civic areas um, would need to um, go through the appropriate process on the back of the Deputy Law Mayor's recent motion. That work is underway. If there is a, a view or an intent of the Chamber to allow us um, to um, open up those um, civic spaces for different uses, then obviously um, that will go through, um, through the Office of the Lord Mayor, who has um, current responsibility for use of all the civic spaces. Um, so the team here tonight purely is talking about the town hall, not the civic area. However, we can take that feedback on board and make sure that that's integrated into the work that the Office of the Lord Mayor is doing um, as part of um, the work and response to your... Um, <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I was looking over there. I should be looking over here. Um, it, it is my thorough view that that is your lowest hanging fruit for increasing the usage of this building is activating. Those are the areas which aren't active. So uh, I think if you increased activation, you'd see a similar activation as the building. Thank you, Councillor Hines. Councillor Kamal. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I do like the report, and uh, yes, uh, flexibility. I mean, it, it is all about uh, making us relevant to, to people in general. And yes, I, I, I thoroughly agree with uh, uh, you know being as flexible as you need to and can be, um, and certainly utilising all the spaces you can in the first instance while we're having a conversation about the other. Because at the end of the day, this is something you can do now, uh, whereas the other needs 
quite a lot of work first before we do anything. And I think um, it would be quite intriguing to see how much we can actually, uh, you know, increase the activity and with that flexibility, particularly around contracting on, on the catering, et cetera, because that, I think is a major impediment. Councillor Thank you, Chair. But, I mean, just add on to about the catering contract, catering contracts, because over the last decade, I would say like 10 years, I have myself have tried to arrange like community events in town hall for many, many times. And every single time the difficulties we have got on one hand is the cost. And not just the cost to hide the hall. I mean, hiding the hall is a reasonable cost. It is about, I mean, how much you charge for catering per head. Besides that, it is about the beverage cost. For beverage cost, if I'm not wrong, it's somewhere around $38 or $48 per head. It doesn't matter if you drink or not. It doesn't matter if you're underage or not. As long as you show up, you still need to pay for it. And I think that is completely wrong because really like many of the communities, community groups will already have their wine sponsors, wine sponsors and they don't need any, any wines or any alcohol from the, cater, the catering contracted, all right? And they still charge so much. Hence, many of the community events, instead of having it in our town hall, they have to move on to like those hall, say Donato halls or any other community halls in the suburb or even in army town hall. So yeah, to me, it's kind of like quite disappointing. And besides that, looking at some of the, those like ethnic groups, say like the local Chinese community, Vietnamese community or Indian community, for their cultural festivals or celebrations, whatsoever, they quite often require to serve those cultural food instead of, I mean, like what, what we normally serve, like steak and, and the three course menu and the kind of stuff. So uh, I think like we, we do need to look at this and have it, I mean, give it, I mean, make it, make it probably even make it open for them to choose their their, their own caterer for their events in some occasion, in, in some occasions. And, and also make it quite flexible for, for, for the beverage cost. Because many of those events, you, you're going to have like the underage coming in. And it's just kind of ridiculous to charge those under, underage people, let's like say $38 per head. It will make the event organizer almost impossible to host our event in our town hall. Thank you. Um, through the chair, um, thank you very much for that feedback. It is something that we have heard extensively. Um, we're currently um, about to go out to tender for a caterer. Uh, it won't be an exclusive contract. Um, people will be able to um, use the venue without using the caterer. We will request that they use um, a caterer from the City of Adelaide caterer um, coming in or they can bring their own food. So there will be some restrictions around that, obviously for health and safety, but um, <coughs> certainly we have taken this on board um, and going forward there will be opportunities uh, to use the venue and not to use um, one caterer. Sorry Chair, what about the beverage arrangements? Um, we're looking at the beverage arrangements as well and that will certainly be taken into account so around when we go to tender around that. Um, we also have to consider um, the, um, who holds the um, liquor licence for the venue and that's something that we're currently investigating as well as to how we can make that easier. One more question, Chief. Yes, and about the cost to hire the town hall, so like certainly like when you're running like community events, you might have a discount. When you run like, like commercial events, then it might be on the stand, standard rates. Have you got any guidelines on this? Through the chair. Yes, we're looking at um, bringing different um, booking fees depending on the type of user that's going to do it. We're also looking in order to activate the venue in off peak periods to have um, peak period rates and off peak period rates. And also um, including um, in the community rate, um, people who perhaps are charging a ticket rate, but it's, it's a low ticket rate. So we're going to give them the opportunity to book the venue at a lower price as well. So, um, so we have, we have, we are looking at a variety of things. We will also have partnerships and co-presenter um, arrangements um, that will look on so that we can meet the needs of council. When would you be able to bring it to, I mean, either the committee or or the or, or the council? 
The intention is that the fees and charges can be changed by the administration. Um, and that's an operational thing. So if if um, the feedback is um, that you're okay with um, what's approach, with this approach, then the intention would be to look at the fees and charges. Anyone else? Members? I just would like to reiterate what Councillor Ho had said. You know, um, I too have had different ethnic groups who have said the same thing to me. And, and um, you know, we just want the town hall to be accessible to everyone. Um, but just going back to the catering contract, you're not, are you looking to go with one specific person with a three tier, or um, are you looking at being a bit more broad, or can that just be explained to me and put that up right? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, we would be looking to have um, one caterer who will have exclusive use of the kitchens, who will provide, people can choose to use that caterer if they wish, or they can choose that they will um, bring in food to the venue, or um, they can um, use our local City of Adelaide caterer. So there, there will be three options within that. Okay, um, I do also agree with Councillor Hyde, the Queen Adelaide room, if, you know, obviously civic events come first, but it would be great if, um, you know, now with COVID, you've got smaller events happening and people might want to hire that out, that space there, which is quite beautiful. So we can look at that, that will be awesome. Um, yeah, basically, I'd make, I'd just make having it more flexible for the public and more open, it's great, yeah. Thank you. Um, item 4.4, uh, City Street Activation. Um, do you want to take that as well? Are you going to speak to the other bit to it, Michelle? Or is it you? Yeah. Um, so our uh, presentation night has been prepared by two teams, so both our city policy and our regulatory services team. So um, Steve Zalewski is the AD of regulatory services and Rick Hutchins, our manager for city planning and heritage, and they're going to take you through the workshop. We're going to take the item um, as read and um, Steve and Rick will do a very brief um, presentation, brief introduction to it and really focus on the key questions there. Thanks Michelle and through you Chair, yes we'll keep it uh, brief and take it as read. I just wanted to think members back into why we're here and that's to do with an increased in level of interest that we're getting from our business community to uh, either expand their own outdoor dining offering or to create and facilitate new outdoor dining areas uh, onto the street. Now this is both as a result or to create more um, additional space for social distancing requirements um, given the last year, but also to increase and attract more people to their premises and to the city as a whole. Um, parklets or city street activations do create and come with some challenges, um, but while we're here tonight, we really do think a well-considered approach to a policy and guideline on them does um, help us deliver um, for our businesses and help us to deliver our strategic plan. We look at uh, strong economies, um, a talk to supporting city businesses and reducing red tape, um, which this will help to do. Um, thriving communities and a dynamic city culture all link to bringing people into our city, creating safe experiences uh, and helping that um, shine. Um, I guess we're also seeing businesses keen to invest in parklets and invest quite significant money. So they see the value um, as a way to improve their own financial position and to bring people back into the city. Um, so we think setting a clear policy, um, uh, getting your feedback on that tonight will help us to deliver that. And also one with our recently endorsed temporary uses of public space policy, um, which does call out um, the use of public space for economic driving as well. And just finally, before getting into the key questions we have tonight, so the council last run the Parklet program in 2012 to 16. Um, so there have been certainly considerable changes and missed drivers in terms of city activations at, at, since that time. So we're really seeking your feedback now so that we can really um, get the policy so it sits right. So it's um, really a win-win for everyone from, from business, from community and public and for council, considering as, as Steve alluded to, there's some of those challenges that we have really in the 
space of how we use the limited space that we have uh, within, our, within our city streets. So maybe if I leave it there, we do have three um, questions that we would like to go through with you tonight. Um, first is around looking at fixed structures on parcel areas. Second around, it's a question around public versus private use and whether you could designate those places as private use only. And the third around the fees and charges that might apply to, to parklets. So if we head to the, the first, um, first question and really seek any questions or comments from, from members within your, as we just, for those, just we did include really a series of prompts to try and help the discussion tonight in the papers. So if we can go to the first question on views on fixed structures within these spaces. Do you want to take the question in part? Um, I think if we take this question and we can move on to the second question, yeah. So members, um, we're on the first question, so Councillor Hyde. Um, I'm going to answer your question with a question, sorry. Uh, are there varying degrees of fixed in your mind? On, I'm thinking back to the golden model example, and I think they had to put a couple of bolts in the ground, but not much. And in, in what we're looking at here, is yeah. all of, are all of these just sitting there or have any of them been bolted on? Because I'm assuming the answer is no, because the previous policy didn't allow for that. Yeah. Is that correct? So generally, the, yeah, through, through the, sorry, the, the general principle with parklets is that they are a freestanding structure placed within a, a space and can be taken taken away. So they wouldn't sort of very minimal for all fixings to those um, spaces. I think what we're talking about here is in terms of fixed structures being those items that would remain within that space when when the area is being used and when the area is not being being used. So that's really the, a question in terms of, of what guess what we would mean by fixed structures, not necessarily fixed to the to the street space. No, it doesn't. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'll yeah, so, so through the chair, um, so what we're talking about, and if you look at those images, they're not fixed into the ground, but they sit there permanently rather than, say, outdoor dining where they have to pack it up each night and put it away and have storage inside. So it, it might be fixed in terms of the barriers, it might be the seating, it might be an, um, you know, an umbrella, but that they're not packed away each night. Right, sorry, I thought a part of it was fixed, so um, <laughs> yes, that's... That's fine. And, and just in answer to your first question, we do get the range of applications. So we're getting applications or people registering interest, and it's um, the full gamut from something that's quite light touch to quite significant. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, it's hard to make a judgment call on these things without seeing them. Ultimately, I would say, above all else, aesthetics and design reign supreme. I'd be happy for you to <coughs> bolt something into the ground if it's really good looking. Um, but if it's ugly, I don't care if it's just sitting there, no. or if you or if you take it away into your shop. If it's ugly, I don't want it. Thank you, Councillor Kieran. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm, yeah, it's really hard. I agree, Councillor Hyde. It's, it's sort of horses for courses, really, with each particular situation. Um, I, I would just be really mindful of the um, uh, the trade-off between hospitality and non-hospitality. Um, so I always cite the example of a soul. A practitioner, accountant, or psychologist um, having a, a, an office space somewhere uh, situated near a hospitality business, which then encroaches on the street and uh, takes up more space in the form of a park. But I think it's one thing, I, I think we've got to be careful of assuming that we are attracting more people into the city because we see more people on the streets. Um, what we may in fact be doing is attracting more people to particular businesses which are uh, uh, hospitality business and only particular businesses within hospitality, uh, but we may be reducing the number of people, for example, repeat customers to the, that sole practitioner uh, psychologist may be uh, dissuaded uh, from coming to the city in the future, um, simply because one, they may not be uh, get a parking space that uh, has been foregone uh, in that spot. Uh, another example is, it's a bit less often, but if you get a pub that's particularly, um, shall we say, convivial, uh, and the front of the pub, the, the, the part of that space has become an extension of the pub, uh, you may uh, dissuade people from going to, to non, the non-hospitality reasons to that part of the street because there's noise and conviviality and whatnot. Um, so I, I, I just think we've got to be very careful with not with our language. Um, 
and, and not assume that more people on the streets means more people coming into the city. That's just really vital that we get that economic that capital. And, then, and it's, it's, it's consultation with businesses nearby. It's really making sure that the people who might depend, one parking space could mean everything to your soul practitioner psychologist. Um, it could mean uh, life or death for that person's business. Um, so we really must make sure that in every instance that we, we do these things that they're they properly consulted. Um, but apart from that, I echo what Councillor Hyde says, I think, you know, you do want nice looking structures. Is that by long store, that one out of the picture? Sorry, I know it's a bit random, but is it, is there's a restaurant group? You know that? No. That sort of nice looking one. That, no. That, yeah, that long one on the top. What no, similar, but no, and these are examples chosen not not specifically for single oh, businesses. Right. So we didn't want to single right. out any yeah, business yeah. and say whether you like that. This is because they've got a nice one out the front. I think I think they put that all in. But it's, I think it's what's called, and the businesses themselves want to stump up money and improve and, and uh, you know the outdoor uh, view. But I, sorry, I can't get more coherent than that, so I'll stop. Councillor <laughs> Kanal. Um, for what I see uh, in the, the pikelets are. Uh, appropriate to the various circumstances so one it, uh, they can be about a particular business and if we're going to sort of sort of answer a few of the questions and that is very then specific so that they should they should be contributing to that because it's something specific to an individual business rather than the, the general public good it can be in it needs to be in spaces where which are talking about parking where but if you're taking more residential and more secondary streets then the, the parking is not necessarily a major concern in those spaces because Within reasonable distance, you have you know parking alternatives, and this is about enhancing a particular space. And it's not necessarily then about a business; it can be enhancing it for the for the improvement of that particular uh, street setting. So if you don't need it, if you don't have any city seating and that you need to do this, and you also give it a space for people that where they can dwell, um, then that's fantastic. And it, if it enhances that that spot and then enables uh, people to use it in different ways, then you know you so you have a community uh, benefit for that. As against a specific business business benefit and in there there is then there's just a precinct benefit where you know you are giving them a, a little bit more uh, space uh, or something else that they can use and one of the things that came up in a conversation earlier and that is also something that's not necessarily going to encourage people to loiter there so in other words yes you do need the good looking and you do need all of that but if you've got in high in high traffic areas then obviously that discourages uh, people using it for the wrong purpose or for purpose unintended, but uh, for the other structures, how do you minimise that being a, becoming a permanent shelter for someone and therefore discouraging its actual use? Um, yes, uh, parking probably. So I, th I see you having it as a variety of different reasons for, for having it there, and some of it can be just an ability for, for a street to have a place where they can sit together on it. And I'm just thinking of Charlotte Place, where it's a, you know, could have a little space there where they can hang out uh, to uh, some of the other main streets. But that's, that's the main one of that. I mean, the paying for it if you're going to get personal use out of it. And uh, yes, um, we're not talking about outdoor dining fees, but if it's going to enhance a business's, um, you know, uh, ability beyond uh, it's not using the footpath but you're using getting extra space well that's something that you know it's it, that's giving you an extra benefit so therefore there, there should be something for that or if it's going to be for certain businesses we say well more people come here and so if it's going to be a really a direct business benefit and obviously then the, there should be something for the space not necessarily the utilization of the bit on top like like dining outdoor dining fees and things like that Councillor Thank you, Chair. Um, before I answer this question, can I just ask a quick question for you, Chair? Um, uh, so, if we're developing a policy or guidelines for this, um, then does that mean that any applications about any pilots that would be dealt with by council staff, it won't necessarily go to council assessment panel or come into council for approval or anything like that? So depending on the nature of the structure, so usually um, applications like this would be dealt with by administration, so there's the recent one that's come in, given the nature and size and scope of the structure and some of the fixed elements, it's designated that it needed to go through to CAT, but um, what we look for in developing a policy or guideline is actually to work on some of those processes of what would come in versus yeah. what would be delegated to administration. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I guess, yeah, to go back to that question, um, 
uh, pretty much what uh, Councillor Kerr and Councillor Hyde and to a degree what Councillor uh, Canola has said that yeah, if it is something that is uh, just nice looking, yeah, we're all we're open to it. And personally, I think um, if anything, this will be an extra level of activation. All well and good to activate footpaths, and if you want that extra level of activation, pour them up in the streets. I'm just going to answer this question since you're taking it in parts. Um, I, uh, if you've been to Sydney, uh, they use a lot of parklets and it looks fantastic um, and it brings um, a whole different range of people, but they strategically place them, like in ca to Councillor Kira's point, you know, where there is a mass of a lot of hospitality businesses and it doesn't inhibit other types of businesses. And I think we need to be mindful of that. Um, and especially the way that we, the, our ratepayers are so um, protective over their car parking. So we need to be a little bit mindful of, of that as well. Um, that's my only feedback on that question. So I think regarding the fixed structure, um, I think a design is actually, you know, um, personal. I think what you might think is ugly, someone else might think is beautiful. So I think we need to set maybe parameters about you know about that and what you know what you think is good, what we think is good looking but you know I, I would say that you if admin are making a decision on this then you're probably looking at it aesthetically as well in yeah. in line with a street I would say so thanks. that's my feedback we might go to the next question yeah so the next one is um, what are council members' views on the designation of parklets for private use only? So some context around that question. With the, the large parklet program, um, the sign that you may or may not be able to read on the screen there um, was based on the guidelines where the parklet was open to use of the general public at all times. So it wasn't exclusive use for the person who, or the business that it may have related to. So. Um, it's really a question in terms of members' views on that moving forward and setting a new new approach. Councillor Hyde. Um, and, and when that was the case through Chair, um, these these parklets here, were these an initiative of Splash? Like, were these funded by the Council? Mm -hmm. That was uh, that's, that's, that's Through Chair. So, um, I'm not sure the exact photo there. There were some that were funded uh, along Bank Street through the state government. Um, it would have been about between 2012-16. There were also we had involvement in them as well. I'm not sure of the exact funding arrangement. Okay. Um, it was quite mixed through the through the chair. Um, so as Steve's indicated, some were delivered through state government, some were delivered by us, some were delivered by businesses. Um, the the underlying principle for all of those parklets was that they should be available for use by anyone at all times. Obviously, that generated some conflict because during a busy lunchtime period, um, a business would want only paying customers sitting out there. But if someone else was wondering through and fancy eating their packed lunch, sitting there, the business have no ability to uh, manage that space. So the reason why the team's asking this question tonight is to make sure that we don't end up in that same sort of challenging scenario and putting too much pressure on businesses to manage these spaces in a, in a way that you know detracts from what they're good at, which is running a business. I think in order to answer uh, your second question, I need to answer your third question um, uh, as well, uh, which is um, uh, the short answer is um, yes, they could be designated for private use only um, if we're operating on a model where uh, they, they put it in themselves, they pay for it themselves. <laughs> Um, uh, and, and we charge them fees. Now, you could look at a hybrid option there whereby you charge them less fees if they don't have it for exclusive private use. Um, there are other things you could do uh, which I would encourage investigating, such as outside of the hours of their operation, it's obviously not exclusive private use. Um, uh, so they can only use it when, when they're open and, and, the, and, and they shouldn't do anything to inhibit access to it. Um, uh, when they're when they're not open, I'd encourage you to investigate that. Um, the cleaning and maintenance of it then may also become an issue. Um, so that's something that needs to be explored as well. Um, but you, you know, there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. But but I would say if 
we haven't in our budget allowed any money for pilots, if I'm correct. And therefore we, at the moment, are not going to be funding any pilots and, and, and thus I, I am not, I, I'm not going to say that we should say, yeah, you can have one, you pay for it, put it in, and you're not going to have the use of it. Um, I do also think that we need to balance um, as well, and I'll be interested to see how the policy ultimately addresses this, um, any loss of revenue because of, depending on where you put your parklet, um, uh, in a paid on-street car park, um, uh, that needs to be thought of as well, and whether your fee structure is informed by that, I don't want to make it too complicated, but, um, uh, and, and also I just, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to hand one part of council, the administration, power to substantially, um, you know, affect the revenue that we're, that we're bringing in necessarily. Um, uh, so I would also, separate to all these questions, um, where I, I think we need some transparency around, okay, if we're going to put in 10 parklets, what is the actual uh, opportunity cost of that? Um, uh, after a period of time, maybe maybe a six monthly policy review or something like that. I'd just like to see that feedback. Councillor Thank you. Can I just add to that? Apologies um, through your chair. Um, so recently endorsed permit fee model framework, which actually will help to support what we're talking about now and look to um, be able to charge um, appropriately for use of public space, which will help some of the impacts you're talking about then. But I think, as you suggested, a tiered approach might be something we need to look at. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just quickly following on what uh, Councillor Hyde was uh, saying, um, it would be it would be good if we can maybe uh, um, get provided with a couple of different uh, models. One for maybe just private, and another one that might be that might be a hybrid, and I guess um, fees associated with uh, with each of the model, and, and possibly a recommendation. Um, because then at least you can sort of uh, go into a bit more detail around why you think a particular model would work uh, better. So that's my feedback on, on both of those questions. Councillor Yes, so following on with my other councillors is that, um, I mean, I, I think there'd be a, a, a bit of a variety of uses for each of them for different, uh, for different purposes. As we've, we've talked about, but again, it is, it is a great consideration for what you lose in parking in that space. It should be part of your, your thought process. Um, again, ensuring that there is a sufficient alternative for what people can go to and for whatever you're taking, because you know, you, uh, and because again, it's about the more uh, residential, the more uh, the smaller streets that you're looking at activating, because the busy ones, well, there, there wouldn't be any amenity in that, uh, besides you know, traffic jams. Um, and then yeah, certainly having that uh, variety of, of options um, and, and, and also if it's going to be something specific that you're encouraging people to eat in a particular place by enabling a better, more, more seating, etc. Well, it can be limited to their, their dining options. So from this time until this time exactly, that, uh, that's, that can be for an exclusive use and outside these times, well, no one's going to care anyway, but that for them it's about their, their uh, income generating times. And if that's the case, then that, and I think that should be quite acceptable. That uh, you're, you know, you're charging a fee for a for that times that they're actually serving customers. And outside of that, you know, people who do, uh, you know, within reason, uh, they can use those, those spaces. Sure, Councillor Hyde. Um, uh, only because this is something that keeps coming up since we changed our um, uh, rules on the use of public space. Um, uh, and fixtures and that, and I'm just identifying this earlier on in the piece, is that um, if you say to some hospitality businesses, uh, yes, you can put something fixed in there if you're taking out a car park and paying for it yourself, you do create um, uh, sort of an inequity with other businesses who just want to pop in an umbrella or have some sort of infrastructure somewhere where there is still space, um, but it's just there's not a car park there. So I just, I just want to flag that mainly for my colleagues' um, benefit, and I don't want you to go unpicking that other policy um, yet. But just to be aware, I feel lots of complaints about that, and if we're uh, picking winners in this in this sort of way, and, and I'm just thinking about because they can, they are effectively going to be paying premium potentially and having seats in there and having a cover in there, 
and other businesses would love to have that sort of amenity. I just want to make <coughs> through the presiding member, if I could just comment on that. That um, principle was established as part of um, council not charging for outdoor dining. So the part of trade-off was no fixed furniture because obviously the cost of maintenance and um, the inequity that the fixed furniture was delivering across outdoor hospitality, um, it was felt then if it was tied to um, no fee, then um, most people felt comfortable that you know some businesses based on their location could um, you know commercialise and gain quite an enhanced revenue um, opportunity from the use of a public footpath. Anyone else, members? I just want to further reiterate Councillor Abraham today when he said it's really need to have a recommendation in regards to you know the fee structure and um, how it would all, would all work if you didn't have that and what the costings would be and what the costings would be for them. So just a bit more information would be great. Sure. Uh, I'm finish. I think, thank you. Yeah, that would all. I think all those are really useful comments and feedback and we will build that into the report that comes back into you for consideration. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, members. This concludes the evening and thank you for your participation tonight. I'm just told by our agency CEO that it was very informative and uh, the feedback has been great and I have really appreciated the structure of tonight's meeting with uh, your participation. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah.